Welcome back here on Live Now from Fox, and you are taking a live look over at the Israel-Gaza border as we get to some developing news out of the Middle East. Palestinian officials reporting another series of deaths during distribution of aid in Gaza. The Palestine Red Crescent saying five people were killed and dozens wounded as gunfire broke out, followed by a stampede. This happening a matter of hours ago. Video from French international media showing a convoy of trucks moving quickly past burning debris near the distribution point this morning as people are heard screaming and then gunfire can be heard. The Palestine Red Crescent reporting thousands of people were gathered there for the arrival of more than a dozen trucks carrying flour and other food. It's not clear whether the people who died were killed by gunfire or the stampede after. Obviously, a lot left to figure out here. Now, I do want to talk about this and the latest other developments coming in out of the Middle East. Mark Chandler is the director of government relations at Coastal Carolina University and a professor of practice. He's also a former senior defense intelligence intelligence official joining us here live. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to be here with us. You're, you're welcome, Josh, and, and good morning to you and all your viewers. Good morning. Well, first off, I do want to talk about that aid distribution because we have seen several incidents that have unfolded as all of these large crowds have gathered and the trucks have been coming in. There's been gunfire and stampedes, deaths reported, injuries reported. I imagine it's got to be fairly difficult to distribute aid in a situation like this. Yeah, Josh, you're exactly right. Th this is a difficult operation when you're trying to distribute aid with, with a lack of security. This incident actually occurred at the Kuwait roundabout up in northern part of the Gaza Strip. It is a, a common site where aid has been distributed in the past. It's also been a site of a couple of these incidents, just like today, that, that's happened in the past. I mean, what you're seeing here is that Israel's allowing the aid to get through. They, they obviously have to check it for security purposes as it crosses into the Gaza Strip. But then it's turned over to the UN and the Palestinian distribution network. And, and this is where it starts to break down. A lack of security, a lack of a, of a methodical distribution process. And I know, you know there's a lot of Palestinians trying to get to this food, but there's got to be a logical process or it benefits no one. Or you get situations like this where people start to rush the convoy. There's no method to the distribution. There's no good security because Israel sets up a, a outer cordon, if you will, to ensure Hamas doesn't try to get in there and, and take that aid. And then the UN and Palestinians have to distribute it. So we're going to, unfortunately, until the UN and Palestinians figure this out, we're going to have, we're going to see more of these. I mean, earlier this week, five Palestinians died trying to get some of the airdrop stuff that the U.S. is doing, and, and they drowned trying to get some of those supplies out of the ocean, out of the Mediterranean. And another developing topic here, a lot of this information coming in as well, as the United Nations peacekeeping mission says that four UN observers were hurt when a shell exploded near them. That was over in southern Lebanon. The Israeli military denying they were involved in any strike there. What do you make of all of this as we do wait for more information to come in? Well, I, I think what you see is, you know, first reporting is always kind of vague. And, and unclear, and this is what we're seeing in this situation. You know, UNIFIL has been operating in that area since the late 70s. So they conduct patrols to try to maintain security between Lebanon and Israel. It's actually between Lebanese Hezbollah and Israel. And then part of this comes from the Yom Kippur War, and you start to see security from uh, across the uh, Syrian side through the Golan Heights. So when you start to look at this, those UN patrols have been there. They have regular patrol routes. Their vehicles are very well marked. I have actually been up to this part of Israel looking at the layout for the Lebanese Hezbollah. And when you look at that, you see the patrol routes. It's going to be hard to hit a U.N. force and not know you're hitting a U.N. force. I believe it's highly unlikely, unlikely that the IDF did this. Probably Lebanese Hezbollah thinking they were hitting uh, Israeli patrol or another group affiliated with Hezbollah that doesn't have as much discipline shooting at the UNIFIL forces. We've seen another strike happening over in Syria. This is near Damascus. It's over in Aleppo. What do we know about the details there? Because at last check, dozens had been killed, and many of them are affiliated with Hezbollah. 
Yeah, Josh, this is a common operating area for Hezbollah, but, but this goes back several years in the breakout of the Syrian civil war. So when that happened, Iran and Hezbollah came together to try to work in support of the Assad regime against the rebels. And so as, as they fought, Hezbollah sent forces into Syria, IRGC from Iran came in there and they worked military operations and Aleppo was one of their major staging locations to conduct operations. Simultaneously, Aleppo's one on one of the key supply routes that Iran has running through Iraq, through Syria to resupply Hezbollah in Lebanon against the Israelis. So what you see is a confluence of, of events and key planning and logistics areas right there in Aleppo. What, what Israel's doing, obviously their intelligence is, is working very well now, trying to be proactive. And you saw a strike against a logistics site for munitions transfer and a planning area that both IRGC and Lebanese Hezbollah use there to try to stay away from where Israel can reach out and touch them. But Israel's been doing this more proactive in recent days. A question and a topic that you and I have discussed time and time again, why has Israel not declared war against Hezbollah? Are we any closer to that actually happening? Could that happen? It, it absolutely could happen. And, and this is, what we're looking at here is, does Israel wanna open a Northern front? I, I think they have their hands full with Gaza, trying to maintain that. And, and Israel's fighting what we call in the military, a holding action up North. So I'm trying to make sure that, that the fighting up north doesn't reach a full open scale war. I know a lot of people interpret what's happening now as war, but this could be significantly worse. We could go back to 2006 where we had a 34 day war where significant destruction and death in Southern Lebanon and in Northern Israel. So you start to look at that. Israel doesn't want to open that. I think Hezbollah is, is Fine, fighting the type of fight that they are. They are, you know, the death of a thousand cuts, if you will, to keep thousands and thousands of Israeli citizens from the north, focus Israeli forces up north to try to distract them from the fight down against Hamas. So I don't think either side wants to escalate it to this at this time. And what I've seen Israel do over the last three to four weeks now is be very proactive and trying to stop the planning that's taking place by Hezbollah with support of the IRGC. We could be close. A miscalculation at any time could escalate that. There were at least five significant Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah strikes on Northern Israel this week. And Israel's striking back each time trying to stop this from escalating. And the reason I always ask you that is because that's the question that I get the most on Twitter and via email is, aren't they already at war? So I'm glad that you can provide some context and some clarity on that overall. I do want to talk a, a little bit more about Hamas, though, because an interesting article was published just a couple days ago by the Jerusalem Post, where they essentially said that it appears that Israel had underestimated the number of fighters that Hamas does have. The number is actually a lot higher. Is that surprising in any way? No, that's not surprising, uh, because what, what you start to look at is it's an estimate of the type of organization and fighters that Hamas has. It's very hard. We we don't, in a traditional military, we've got platoons, companies, battalions. We know our structure. We know our military structure in a traditional military sense. In a terrorist organization, it's very difficult to really determine the exact structure and number because they're not structured traditionally. So you can see thousands more fighters are potentially available and the degree of training obviously adds to that. So I've got less trained, but more, and, and I've got the highly trained but concentrated units that Israel's really been fighting against since the start of this war. So that's expected, and, and you're gonna start to see that evolve out there. We, we vastly underestimated ISIS capabilities and ISIS numbers when they first sprang to life uh, 10, 12 years ago and started fighting across Syria and then almost took over Baghdad in Iraq. Netanyahu initially uh, had canceled the visit from Israeli officials to D.C. after everything kind of played out with the U.S. not vetoing the resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Now he's saying that he's going to reschedule that. Do you think 
And just based on your experience and what you've seen, is he trying to smooth things over with the U.S. by doing that, or do you think he was going to do it anyway? I, I think what, what he would have done, number one, the, the fact that the U.S. abstained from that resolution was a significant public and international blow to Netanyahu and to Israel itself. So you look at that in that context, I think Netanyahu's reaction should have been expected. Uh, I would have been surprised if he hadn't uh, said something of this nature. But when you start to look at the inner workings of these, this relationship, publicly the U.S. seems to be abandoning or putting Israel in a bad light at this time, more for domestic politics, I believe, than for any really real policy. But later this week, I believe just yesterday, the Defense Department started leaking that it was going to release the next tranche of weapons, including aircraft and, and thousands of bombs, release those to Israel. So you still have that support. And while Netanyahu didn't send a senior delegation there, the military relationship and talks did happen this week. So senior defense officials from both countries did meet in Washington to discuss the Rafah campaign. There's some not enough details have come out of that. I know the U.S. wants more information about how Israel is going to conduct Rafa. I don't know how much Israel will release. So you still have that relationship at work. I just think, you know, a little moral courage perhaps on the public side of this to really see where things are going to stand, especially since the U.N. didn't condemn Hamas in the original attack in this latest resolution. That was a significant blow to Israel. April 7th will mark six months since the October 7th attack by Hamas on Israel that essentially led to this all-out war here. Did you think when that attack happened and war was declared, when you and I kind of first started talking about all of this, that six months later, this is where we would be? Well, Josh, I, I, I am a little bit surprised, but I went back and I actually uh, looked at uh, some of the conversations that you and I had, and that's one of the first questions you asked me. How long does this look to play out and i said at the time months and and in my mind my months meant six to eight months so we're approaching that six month point but i look back at history and you see this is the longest war since 1948 that israel has fought in a sustained manner and when i say war i am talking about a full full out combat operation that's going back and forth in this this manner so we're at one of the longest fights that Israel's been in, not counting the intifadas, uh, the fighting in 2006 with Hezbollah. So we're looking at that. Now, you still see fighting taking place in Khan Yunus. Uh, you see at Al-Shifa Hospital, that goes to the Jerusalem Post article of the number of fighters that are still available. But you have to still clear Rafa, and, and Hamas is really dug in there. So I think what you're starting to see is that when the operation of Rafa starts, that's at least a month of fighting, especially with Khan Yunus as an example and, and what happened up in northern Gaza Strip. So you've got at least, I would say, two more months of heavy fighting, but that won't end it, Josh. And, and here's the thing. Israel's objective is to destroy Hamas. That's one of the things that we in the military don't like to hear politicians or policymakers set an example because destroy means kill all fighters and kill the ability for that enemy to fight back. And as we've seen with what ISIS did in Moscow this week, Al Qaeda is still active. And so you start to see all of these terrorist organizations that remain active. I'm not so sure that once the main fighting ends, that you're going to see a complete cessation of hostilities. Israel's still going to have to defend itself, itself, still going to have to fight in smaller unit tactics because until Hamas is destroyed, and that is a most difficult military operation, you're going to see continued attacks. I mean, Hamas is still firing rockets this week against Israel. So this, while the main fighting may, may tamper down a little bit after eight months, I don't think you're going to see peace for some time. All right, Mark Chandler, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and break down some of the latest developments there in the Middle East. Anything else you want to add about anything before I let you go? Well, Josh, I think your questions covered everything this week. I mean, it was a, it was a great discussion with Hezbollah and where we're really seeing a potential for escalation there. I think prefacing what's going to happen here in the near future 
you know, uh, Netanyahu wants to try to start Rafa soon after Ramadan ends, about mid-April. So you still have planning there. We need to perhaps rebuild and reintegrate that relationship with the United States. And then we can't forget the Houthis. The Houthis had several attacks this week. Uh, the U.S. tried to counter on Wednesday and Thursday with additional attacks. The Houthis are remaining viable as they continue to fight and, and tamp off that shipping that goes through the Red Sea. So we're going to see this, this regional campaign continue with a lot of destabilizing effects. All right, Mark, as always, thank you so much for joining us here and have a good rest of your weekend. We appreciate it. You as well, Josh. Thank you very much.